wasn't really a Democrat. The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. We're pleased to have the House Democratic leader with us today, David Toscano. Welcome, sir. Great to be back here. Well, was it a week ago Thursday, the 25th, that the House passed its budget? Uh, right, it was about a week ago, and uh, now the budget is uh, in conference committee. House and Senate trying to reconcile the different budgets. So I understand there were some good cho choices from your point of view, but also some missed opportunities. Well, you know, it's pretty amazing. I've been here now 10 years, and I don't know that I've ever voted for a House budget before, and I did this time. And the reason for that is they had a lot of very good things in there for education. And in my district, education is the number one issue. Uh, major expenditures for K-12 ed uh, education, pay raises for teachers that are well-deserved, uh, per-pupil spending trying to rise to the point it was back in 2007, uh, good investments in VRS for um, local governments. So K-12 through spending, uh, very strong, very strong on higher education. Um, the University of Virginia, Piedmont Virginia Community College are going to do both very well with this budget if we continue to hold it through the conference report. Um, so a lot of good things in the budget for education, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I supported this particular budget. So give us an order of magnitude of where we were in 2007 versus where we are now in terms of uh, uh, both uh, K-12 through and higher education. Right. Well, when the recession hit, uh, something had to be cut. And initially, Governor Kane at the time took the position that he wasn't going to he, he wasn't going to cut uh, K through 12. But as time went along, there 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 were problems, and we had to make some cuts. The result uh, is that even last year, per pupil spending in Virginia was uh, lower than it was in 2008, and that was really hurting our school divisions. So we've been trying to build it up over the last few years. We increased it a little bit last year, and we've increased it a little bit more this year, and I think that's a really good sign. Beyond that, you know, our teachers are paid in the lower echelon of the states uh, for their salaries, and we think that teachers ought to be brought back, in Virginia, brought back to the national average in terms of their uh, salaries. We're getting closer to that, too. So all of these are good signs uh, for K through 12. What about early childhood education? Is there any funding for uh, that? There is. There's not, you know, there's not much of an increase as I think uh, is necessary. You know, there, we have a lot of uh, youngsters who are at risk, uh, and if they don't get some early childhood education, they come into kindergarten or first grade behind their peers, and it's very difficult for them to catch up. There are a lot of studies that show that uh, pre-K uh, investments uh, prove to have benefits later on in the educational uh, cycle and help kids get ahead. Uh, and we think there should be more money there. Now, you know, at, at some point you know, there's just not enough money, and so that was a little bit lagging. But hopefully as the economy continues to improve, we'll have a little more money to put into pre-K, uh, perhaps even next year or the year after. Very important to ensure a, a reading level at, at the third grade because that has a number of negative consequences. Absolutely, and there is, a, there is money. Now, remember, this is all being done in the context of the governor's first two-year right. budget. 
the governor laid down a marker. It was very clear. His number one priority, number one and two priorities are job creation and education, all designed to build a new Virginia economy. So he laid down the marker for K-12, and part of laying down that marker is to make sure there was money to turn around schools that are challenged, especially trying to get at this issue about reading. And I think the House responded and said, we're going to put that money in there, and um, hopefully the Senate will agree with the House position and the governor's position and keep money there for challenged schools in Virginia. Now, you mentioned VRS, the, mm -hmm. the Virginia Retirement System. Uh, that's obviously important, but there's also a teacher raise, isn't there? Yes, there's a 3% teacher raise in the House budget. And uh, the governor's budget had 2%. The House said, well, let's, let's do 3 and that's a better raise for teachers, and I support it. Uh, now, what about Medicaid? It doesn't seem to be in the budget. That's a missed opportunity. I mean, Medicaid, because the House Republicans stripped the Medicaid uh, expansion out of the budget, it meant that there was $157 million that uh, was lost in how you, how you balance the budget. That's a big hole in the budget from what the governor had proposed. So that meant cuts of $157 million that had to come somewhere. And they came primarily in the area of economic development which is something that a lot of us are very concerned about. We have to build this new Virginia economy because we can't depend on the federal largesse for procurement and, and defense contracts coming out of Washington. So we've been trying to figure out a way to, to, to stimulate growth in other areas of the economy, and the House Republicans took a lot of that money out because they were unwilling to accept Medicaid expansion that would have brought millions of dollars back to Virginia. What's the resistance to that, in your opinion? What's the rationale for it? Well, I think there's a lot of people who don't like Obamacare. And anything that smacks of Obamacare is something that they can't embrace. It's become an article of faith among a lot of Republicans here in the General Assembly. The, the irony is that a lot of Republican states, either states controlled by Republican legislatures or Republican governors or both, have said, look, this is too good of an economic deal for us to pass up. It's an opportunity for us to get back tax dollars that we have sent to Washington that are going to be spent in other states for Medicaid expansion. And, you know, uh, places all over the South are taking that money back and saying, we can create jobs with the money. We can help our hospitals with the money. We can help people who really need health insurance with the money. But for, for some reason, Virginia House uh, Virginia Republicans can't find it in their uh, sense to, to take the money back and use it for our citizens. Now, there are a number of preferences that impact the budget, and I think there was a healthy discussion about the coal tax preference. Talk to us about what, what that is and how it works and what the impact of it is. Well, first of all, a tax preference is something that is in the code, baked right in the code, and it gets expended every year. So, for example, if there is a solar tax credit or a coal tax credit, that means that if you invest in solar or you, have, you do something with coal, you get a credit from the state, and it's not subject to appropriations every year. It just comes automatically. Now, there is no solar tax credit in Virginia, but there is a coal tax credit. Those credits are put in place to supposedly stimulate some part of the economy, either create jobs somewhere, uh, create economic activity somewhere. And that's what happened with the coal tax credits when, the, when they were enacted back in the 90s. They were designed to help the coal industry stay above water. The problem is that after $630 million of state pack taxpayer money, so you're in my money, $630 million. million over that period of time, $630 million going south to, to the coal companies and the utilities, we have about one-fifth the jobs that we had back then, and we've got coal production that is about one-quarter to, to one-fifth of what it was 20 years ago. Now, if you were a, a business and you had invested all this money mm -hmm. and you had lost workers and you had lost production, you would say something is not right here. You're not going to invest it anymore. The only difference here is it's your and my money. And we think, or at least a number of us who are critical of this, that we can help Southwest Virginia a lot more efficiently if we took the money that was reserved for those credits and sent it down there to create new jobs in a new Virginia economy 
that has the potential for long-term growth. You know, it could be in the solar industry where you produce solar panels or any other kind of production. But because they need jobs down there, and this is not creating those jobs. So let's find a different way to help them. So I see some of the impact was lessened, I believe. Uh, there was a compromise reached in terms of the, of the annual amount of that coal tax preference. Under the new bill, there is a cap on how much you can get every year, $7.3 million a year. But that's still a lot of money. And, you know, part of the, the, the benefits are going to companies like companies that are in bankruptcy. And again, that doesn't make sense economically to a number of us who think it, that money can be spent more efficiently to create more jobs down in the Southwest. Now, there's a dispute about what has caused this. Some people suggest it's the Environmental Protection Agency regulations. Other people right. point out, however, that there's a lot of competition now right. as a result of fracking and natural gas. Well, you know, a lot of people po uh, point to the so-called war on coal. It, the war on coal is being waged by the marketplace. It's not being waged by Washington. It is true that the EPA wants to control CO2 emissions. And, you know, we do have to improve the smokestacks in order to improve CO2 emissions. But the real threat to coal is coming from natural gas that's undercut the cost, the price of coal, and the fact that China is not burning as much coal. So we don't, we don't export as much coal to China anymore. It's a global market, and the global marketplace is wreaking havoc on the coal industry. Uh, so why should we be pouring our tax money into something that is a declining industry? we got to figure out a way to transition those jobs in southwest Virginia to good-paying jobs down there in the communities where people live. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, additional funding for higher education. Let's focus on the uh, University of Virginia in Charlottesville, it's especially in terms of the kinds of research facilities it has and the ability to help create new jobs. A really good question. You know, it used to be the University of Virginia was not seen as a sort of high-powered scientific enterprise research uh, university. That has dramatically changed in the last 20 years. And now there are more and more cr very creative entrepreneurial type professors who are at the University of Virginia and they're trying to commercialize ideas that can change the world, whether it has to do with how you treat br brain disorders or pancreatic cancer, a whole host of bioscience initiatives. This uh, educational institution is changing dramatically. We're trying to provide the incentives, financial incentives, to get really high-powered faculty at the University of Virginia that can commercialize ideas out of that university, get them to market, create economic activity. Charlottesville has now become a mini-hub for bioscience initiatives. There are a lot of private companies, some of which have spun out of the university, some of which were created on their own, that are really on the cutting edge of some of this bioscience research. So the state money that we use to provide those incentives can be very useful to these local communities, especially a place like Charlottesville. And of course, you mentioned Piedmont Community College. What role does it have to play in the new Virginia economy? Right. Uh, the community colleges play a very important role, and they play it in the area of what we call credentialing. This would be this, this notion that somebody goes to a community college to sort of transition from one job they had to another job they have, hopefully in this new Virginia economy. And the community college creates a program that creates a credential. It's not like a BA or a BS. It's mm -hmm. something like a, something that can be used in a trade. But these are trades that might pay a lot more money than, than you would typically think. The key is to link up the program with the job. Uh, some places just create a program and there's no job at the end. What we're trying to do with the community colleges is have that program be created with the private sector to lead to that job when that person comes out, whether they're a youngster who just coming out of high school or whether there's somebody in their, you know, in their 20s or 30s who are seeking to retrain themselves for some other job. I think the governor in his uh, initial remarks to the General Assembly highlighted cybersecurity. I think he suggested there are like 17,000 jobs available now, and the average starting salary is $80,000. Right. Tremendous opportunities for people. We could be the cybersecurity uh, capital of the country. 
Now, that was one of the missed opportunities in the budget. The governor had $14.7 million for cybersecurity initiatives. The House Republicans took it out of the budget. It's something I, I didn't support. I'm hoping that we can get some of that money back in into the final budget because this is a place where Virginia can really make its mark. And of course, those community colleges uh, allow for a transition for veterans returning from our theaters of war who have gained significant practical experience in a lot of different fields. Absolutely. And the good news is that there's broad bipartisan support to provide assistance to veterans and try to make this place the most veteran friendly state in the country. The governor has been leading on this, but it's the Democrats and Republicans. We, we both embrace this idea. And uh, what we're talking about in terms of getting those jobs and getting people who have already some degree of training placing those jobs is going to be helpful to, the Virginia, to Virginia and helpful to the country. I guess a good example of that is someone who served as a medic who comes back and can now uh, obtain credit for his or her experience to become an emergency medical technician. Absolutely. We, we've got to take advantage of those skills that they've acquired while they've been in the military, and I think we can. Now, what's this concept uh, called Go Virginia all about? Well, Go Virginia was an initiative of a number of uh, 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 business leaders around the state who said, we have to think about economic development in a new way. Oftentimes what happens is there, there are like these silos of economic development initiatives. Communities co compete against communities, often in the same region, for the same company and for the same economic development initiatives. Go Virginia says we ought to be competing as regions. We ought to be cooperating as regions to bring in these companies or to encourage the expansion of companies that already exist in our region so they don't go to some other state. So there's some uh, money in the budget to provide those incentives and grants to regions uh, to try to recruit and retain good businesses. This is going to be terrific for our region because we do more cooperation, Charlottesville and Albemarle, and the region as a whole with the university than almost any other place in the Commonwealth. So we're going to be able to take great advantage of this, this, these grant initiatives because we're going to be able to compete for them maybe much more effective, effectively than other parts of the Commonwealth. Now, you hold the original Thomas Jefferson seat, I believe, and there was a House Resolution 75, I think, that, uh, that, that you authored and, and pursued. What was that about? Well, that was really interesting. Uh, you know, everybody's talking about Donald Trump, right? So Donald Trump uh, made that pretty outrageous statement that he didn't want to have Muslims to be allowed in the country. And I said, no, we can't have that. So I produced a resolution that was uh, critical of those kinds of remarks and tried to get the House on record as being more welcoming to people from other countries who may, uh, may be fleeing persecution and may bring skills and attributes to this country that's helped make us so great over the years, make us exceptional. And after we took out some of the language related to Donald Trump per se, we were able to get that passed, and it does include some of the concerns that Jefferson advanced in the Statute on Religious Freedom that you ought to have and be welcoming to people of all faiths and, and not deny them admission to this country just because they practice a certain religion. Uh, there was a surprising development th this session uh, regarding uh, the Second Amendment, Second Amendment and gun, gun rights. The Attorney General issued uh, an order basically invalidating uh, the concealed carry uh, recipro reciprocity agreements with about 25 other states. Tell, the, tell us uh, how they got resolved. Well, it's probably the most fascinating story of, of this General Assembly session. Because when, uh, when Attorney General Herring took his action, which was perfectly permissible under law, in fact, he was required to review these reciprocity agreements, and he concluded that they didn't meet the standards of our Virginia law, he really pushed a button. And the NRA was very, very upset. Uh, for me, it was always a question of having Alaska or Missouri dictate to us whether or not we could enforce how people conceal carry in Virginia, because their criteria might be less than ours. Their standards might be less than ours. But for people in Virginia, their concern was they wanted to be able to carry out of state. And they were concerned that if we invalidate 
we don't recognize M Missouri's law, they're not going to recognize ours, and they couldn't carry out a state. So the NRA went to the governor and said, can we make a deal? And the governor, is a, he's a man who knows how to make a deal. And so the deal was we would change the rules on reciprocity to make them m more equal. And in exchange, there would be two bills that gun safety advocates have had uh, crusaded for for years. One was designed to give more protection to people who are subject to domestic abuse. Uh, and two was to put voluntary background checks at gun shows where a private seller could go to a state policeman who's there at the gun show and say, well, Woody wants this gun, but I'm not sure Woody should have this gun. Right. Will you do a, a, a check on him and make sure he's okay? Uh, and that closing of the so-called gun, gun show loophole, that was the deal. So three bills were passed in the House, three bills were passed in the Senate. The governor signed all the bills and the deal is in place right now. And it's a fascinating story of how compromise can be achieved in the General Assembly. So if there's a permanent domestic violence order out against me, for example, I'm no longer able to uh, possess, a, possess a firearm, as I understand it. That, that, that was one That's point. Right. The other is, to the extent I am not a federally licensed vendor at a gun show, uh, I have the opportunity now to do a background check to someone I want to sell a firearm to by way of the state police who, who are going to be there. You described it so much better than I could. <laughs> but yeah, it's not only that, but you have to surrender your firearm. And if okay. you do not do that, it's a class six felony. That is very serious business. That a felony and you, it can end you up in the prison, prison. So it's a very serious change in that law. And I think the evidence has been that there have been a number of cases where people have been killed even though mm -hmm. the, the perpetrator of the murder was subject to a protective order. Now, if you could eliminate four or five deaths in a year, mm -hmm. 10 or 15, it is a huge change. And do we need to do more with gun violence? Certainly we do. But this, I think, represents a change that uh, we never would have expected when we started this session this year. Now, you also serve on the House Transportation Committee. Uh, you, you were here when the 2013 funding bill passed. Uh, there was another compromise this year dealing with uh, I-66 West inside the Beltway. Right. Uh, how did that come about? Well, you know, the, the governor, well, a lot of people, I-66 is the most congested thoroughfare probably in the country, I think. And something needs to change there. And there's not enough money in the state coffers to build new capacity. So the only way you're going to do it is you're going to have to bring in private capital. The only way you get return on the private capital is you've got to toll the road. And so it's become a very controversial issue up in Northern Virginia. A lot of people want more new capacity, but they don't want to pay tolls. So what happened as a result was a compromise that said that <clears throat> we're only going to toll certain, certain uh, interstates in the Commonwealth, certain roads in the Commonwealth. We're not going to toll any other ro roads without the approval of the General Assembly. And we're generally not going to toll roads that are already in existence. We've got to toll for roads that create new capacity. And so it's not just a revenue source. And I think as a result of that, you're going to see some proposals in Northern Virginia that will involve tolling on I-66 coupled with the building of new capacity and new capacity for uh, buses and mass transit that will be part of the package. Because you can't solve the problem just by building more and more capacity on roads. It's just not enough room and the cars tend to overwhelm it. So you've got to have uh, uh, you've got to have mass transit, you've got to have uh, opportunities for people to travel that are not in their cars. I guess there were some lessons learned from <coughs> the Elizabeth Crossing uh, matter in uh, the Hampton Roads area, even though that was a design bill, not a public-private par partnership, but, but I think people just don't like paying tolls, especially when there are no improvements. Yes, you know, and in my region, you know, people don't pay that much attention to it. But it's important for the, for the economic development in the Commonwealth, which affects my region, our region. You know, if, if Northern Virginia is gridlocked, 
people aren't going to come there. They're not going to locate their business there. And they're not going to generate tax revenues that come to Virginia that help fund our schools in Charlottesville, Albemarle, in, in, in Augusta, in, in Nelson County, all over the Commonwealth. So we got to make sure we take care of Northern Virginia in a way that's going to create economic growth. Uh, there was another item in, in, in the governor's budget that had to do with $350 million for the Port of Virginia. Why is that important? The Port of Virginia is part of building this new Virginia economy. You know, we think of a port, that's always been the case here, we've had a port for a long, long time. But our port is special because it's really a deep water port and it can accept these huge ships that, uh, you know, it's not, not your sailboat, you know. This right, is, these are right. huge tankers, carriers of a lot of goods and materials. And if we have the technological advancements in our port, we can outcompete York, Charleston, Baltimore, other places, and get more of the freight rolling through here. That means we have to take that freight, we put them on rail cars, Norfolk Southern benefits, CSX benefits, uh, these, uh, we get the revenue out of the port itself, what helps drive the economic engine of the Commonwealth. All these things fit together. All of that helps people throughout the state, not just in the Hampton Roads area. And the governor has pointed out how uh, turning abroad is a huge economic uh, driver uh, for the Commonwealth of Virginia in the future. The markets are incredible, you know, whether it's soybeans or whatever it is, we, we, we have the ability to market our goods, but we got to get them there. And you just can't get them there without a, a delivery system. And some of these big ships are part of that delivery system. Got about a minute and a half left, but I wanted you to comment on the earlier ceremonial session in Williamsburg, Virginia that you were able to attend. Well, that was great. You know, we do that, uh, I think it's every four years. and. Um, it's always wonderful to walk into the old House of Burgesses, the House of Delegates Chambers in, in, in Williamsburg and in, in this old colonial setting. You know, you're sitting on the wooden benches. It's all very close. Uh, nothing like today where you got the palatial uh, house chamber. And you recognize, you know, what people had to go through back then at the dawn of this democracy and the significance of what people did in Virginia and in Williamsburg when they were fighting back against the king and trying to make something out of this nascent republic that we were creating. Uh, uh, you know, democracy doesn't just happen. It, 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 it's created because a lot of people are engaged in the process. And, uh, you know, you can lose it overnight. What Franklin said when he walked out of the convention in Philadelphia to the woman who said, what have you created? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. Thank you. We'll end there. Thank you for being here, David Toscano. Thank you. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. <laughs>